Thanks. Um, so hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Dan, for inviting me and for hosting us. Thank you. Um, so Local Projects is a hybrid digital and physical design studio, and we call ourselves media designers. And to that end, much as uh, architects would design with physical items, uh, we basically employ medium in, this, in media in the same type of building blocks. I have a background actually in interior architecture. I designed museum exhibits for seven years for Ralph Applebaum Associates before leaving there and starting my own uh, studio. And the, the name of the studio, Local Projects, is very specifically titled. It's based on this anecdote by Tip O'Neill, this American congressman who used to say, all politics are local. And for us, all design is local. It's very specifically rooted uh, in the word that we like to use is indigenous to the specific parameters of the project. So we don't have a house style. We don't have a house technology. We're, uh, we're platform agnostic. We're solution agnostic. We really like to sort of steep ourselves in the specifics of the projects themselves to really come up with the solutions. Um, and the types of projects we have are incredibly diverse. Um, these days we're working on the National Museum of American Jewish History, which is a new Polchek partnership uh, down in Philadelphia on Independence Mall. We're doing media design for the Museum of Chinese in the Americas, and MOCA uh, right down here actually. And my lady is doing the architecture. We're doing a cell phone tour for the Statue of Liberty. Um, we're doing six films for the Beijing 08 Olympics. And recently we've got our largest. Our largest commission today, which is the World Trade Center Memorial Museum, which we're doing in partnership with Pink Design, so that launches. Um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about that, although obviously we've just got assigned the product, so we don't have anything actually to show. Um, so we do three basic things. We uh, create innovative interfaces. Uh, this is mostly for public spaces and for museums, so it's all physical space. We do some projects that engage websites, and I'll show you one. Um, but they're always hybridizing between physical interfaces and then online as well. This is an interface that we built for the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum for J. Evan Miller. Um, it was a digital book for the Triennial three years ago. Um, this is a project we're doing with Weiss Plus Yost Architects. We collaborate with a lot, uh, always with physical designers and with lots of architecture studios. Um, it's a Nautilus-shaped carousel, aquatically themed, that's going to be built in Battery Park um, here in Lower Manhattan. So in the center, there's a giant uh, media device that we call the shadow lantern that's projecting uh, both still and moving images inside of the inside of the building itself. And we're designing both the shadow lantern and the four-minute media display that will become a ride in and of itself. Um, and then what we're probably best known for are these collaborative storytelling projects. These are projects in which uh, groups of people tell stories together, and then the content that they're actually put in uh, becomes the content for the project itself. So the experience of telling the story is actually the experience of the project in and of itself. This is a project for the Flamegrad Science Center in Tucson, Arizona. Um, this is actually the last project that we did physical design for, and it was a vintage-shaped trailer covered in copper, all about mining. And on the interior was a recording booth where underground miners could tell their story stories, and on the exterior, was this image of a miner, which you know promoted and projected about the project, but actually each one of these individual holes is water jet cut in the side of the trailer, so it's actually a giant speaker and it can play the oral histories themselves. Um, I'd like to give uh, credit to this book, which I read when I was launching the studio. This is by this fellow Stephen Weil called Making Museums Matter, and he talked, uh, in short, he talked about uh, moving from museums being about things to being for somebody museums turning themselves inside out and no longer being specifically about uh, what he said in the most sort of harsh words about being in the rescue and salvage business and moving into a sort of community partnership model where museums were really spaces uh, for knowledge production uh, and for communities themselves to enter into dialogue. Probably the best uh, known project that we have and the best example of that is actually StoryCorps, which actually doesn't take place in museums. Uh, we were the interaction designers for this, so there were two architects on the project and a graphic designer. Um, and it, it was really the, the brainchild of Dave Say, who uh, used to run Sound Portraits and now is uh, president founder of StoryCorps. Um, and it's an oral histories project of America, and it's creating uh, this national archive of stories, one interview at a time. So we have, this is our flagship booth at Grand Central Station, and you go to the booth with a relative or a neighbor, uh, you interview them for 45 minutes, you leave with a CD of the experience, and then a copy of the CD goes into the Library of Congress. So it's a way to actually build this giant uh, national uh, narrative database, you know, one interaction at a time. 
Um, we designed these listening stations that sit outside of the booth, and actually, much like the Minders project, you get the sense that the, the booth is sort of self-representational, right? On the inside, there's the, the recording studio. You go in there, very simple to the point there, and say, you tell your story there, and then the stories get edited, they get broadcast, in this case, on listening stations. But then they also go online, they go into compilation CDs, and then also on NPR, they get broadcast every Friday morning. Um, we created these uh, motion graphics to explain the project, because it was actually, uh, at the time, quite a difficult project for people to wrap their heads around. Uh, and I think in the subsequent years, it's actually somewhat become a shorthand for these, what are now called uh, user-generated content projects, where uh, you know, I'll go to meetings and people don't even know I worked on this, and people say, oh, you know, we did a story core type of thing where people tell their stories, et cetera, et cetera. But at the time, uh, it's hard to imagine, it was actually really difficult to explain to people what this project was and how it worked, both from a, a user standpoint and also from NPR standpoint, and then also from funders. It was very difficult in the initial stages to explain the foundations that we weren't just about veteran stories or just about old people's stories, but that we actually were necessarily agnostic about the types of stories that we were going to get. Um, I'm going to take a break and, and play three excerpts from stories uh, that are well known to the story part. We took off and as we ascended, before we had level off, our level off point was 45,000 feet. So before we had level off, Bilbo began using us. The beauty of that is that I believe there's something after life. You can see it in bed. See, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you too. And I say it so often. I tell you, to remind you that as comfy as I am, it's coming from me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio. And it's nice to keep the radio on my house. So this is Durant. I thought I'd give my mother and he knew that. Um, and he saved up and he heard of this and he proposed to my mother with it. And so I thought that I would give it to you so that he could be with us for this also. Um, so I'm going to share my with you right now. Where's the right finger? Yeah, right. Where are you Of course. I love you. This is how your mother and I got married, in a booth in Grand Central Station, uh, with my father's ring. My grandfather was a cab driver for 40 years, he used to pick people up here every day, so it seems right. So we now have uh, three other booths. We have two traveling booths. These are in uh, custom outfitted uh, trailers that are traveling both on the east side and the west side of the country. Um, we designed these listening stations, which are mobile and battery powered, and they can move around outside. We also have a booth uh, that was located at the World Trade Center. It's actually being moved just north of there because the construction is getting very intense. Um, but StoryCorps has a, has a specific partnership with the World Trade Center Memorial Museum and has made a commitment to create one oral history per victim. So that's 2,979 oral histories, and I think they've already gathered over 500. Um, these are the listening stations that we created for that booth. And it's interesting to note that, um, that to date, this is the only piece of physical architecture actually on the site itself that interprets 9-11. Uh, there's the Tribute Center, which is just adjacent to the site, and there's a, a photo exhibition up top. But when this was launched, uh, Governor Pataki came and he cut the ribbon. Uh, it was really, uh, it was literally an unprecedented event. Nobody had actually gotten in green light to do something interpretive about 9-11 on the site. And uh, I mean, this isn't the official you know, story for a line, but my interpretation is that there's something about the shapes of these projects, in particular story for, uh, that allows for uh, a broadcasting of message and for a placement of message that is difficult under other circumstances. Meaning if you put a typical you know, curator-driven, message-driven museum on the site, and ironically enough now that's what I'm actually doing, but... Uh, Um, it would be very, very difficult to get sign-off and to get uh, stakeholders to actually participate in that project. Um, and so there was a way in which uh, StoryCorps, as uh, in a certain way a subversive project where it's just gathering together tons and tons of stories, and those stories are self-representational.